welcome to our webinar, Understanding Research Ethics, which is by jobs.ac.uk, who are an international job board for careers in higher education, as well as a dedicated career advice source with resources, articles and webinars to support you on your career journey. Now, today you've got me, uh, Petra Boynton and James Parry from UK Rio, who's an amazing speaker, and we're going to learn so much from him. And we're going to talk about this topic and get some insights into the importance of research ethics overall. Um, so I'm Petra. I'm a social psychologist by background, and my main interest is, is really in safety and well-being uh, in research, teaching and pastoral care. Uh, and I have a sort of special interest in the how-tos of research. So it's the stuff that you probably should have been taught, I probably should have been taught, but none of us actually were. Um, so that's the sort of perspective I'll be coming from today. Um, and we're very, very lucky to have James with us. And James, I'm going to hand over to you for a quick introduction, please. Hi there, my name's uh, James Parry. I'm Chief Innovation Officer at a charity called the UK Research Integrity Office. UK RIA was created in 2006 to be an independent advisory body, uh, education and training organisation and thought leader on good research practice. Uh, I've been there since the beginning. I was Chief Executive of the charity for 15 years and before then I was an archaeologist. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Um, when you registered for this event, uh, we had the opportunity for you to ask questions uh, about research ethics, uh, which you did. We had loads of really brilliant questions in and James and I have tried to uh, sort of form our talks today around the questions you've asked. And we're also going to have a Q&A session at the end. So um, we've got some pre-selected questions we're going to answer and if you want to ask anything else obviously please do as we go through I would suggest um you know making a note of your question listening to James and I speak first because it might be if we've done our job right we'll have already answered your question uh but if not obviously we're quite happy to do it if we uh run out of time uh, we'll go through your questions anyway and anything we haven't covered we'll make sure we've got additional resources for you at the end. Um, I always get the side of the screen wrong on this but if you click the Q&A button on the top right hand side of your screen which will be not the same side as my screen uh, you can then pop your question in and we will be able to answer it. Uh, so without further ado I'm going to hand over to James for the very first part of this webinar uh, for an introduction into understanding Understanding research ethics. Thanks, James. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, I'll just bring my slides up, everyone. So just give me a moment for that. Okay, we've got the slide show up and annoyingly it started on the final slide, so I'll just quickly go back to the beginning. One moment, please. Always a technical issue. Okay. Right, after that very sneak preview, we'll get started. So I'm going to be giving an overall grounding of research ethics and the role it plays in research, uh, talk about the processes that are involved and some of the key points of research ethics review and also some common misconceptions. So going back to first principles, when we talk about research ethics, what we're talking about are moral principles that govern and that's both in the sense of empower but also constrain how researchers carry out research. Now they're particularly relevant to research that impacts on or involves people, animal subjects or the environment but it's important to know that all types of research regardless of discipline regardless of research where research is carried out whether in a university nhs private sector organization third sector or government and regardless of what level of career stage whether you're an experienced professor with 30 years of experience and lots of letters after your name or you're a PhD student in your first week of study or an undergraduate student, all research has the potential to raise ethical issues. And th those ethical issues must always be considered, even if the research project itself doesn't cross the threshold for acquiring some type of ethical review process or approval process. Now, when we talk about ethics in research, 
we often focus on the third main bullet in this slide, the process for ethics being considered during the conception and design stage of the research and the, the idea that we must get an ethical approval to carry out the work. And approvals to carry out research are often essential. But stepping back, ethics in the broadest sense is those moral principles and how people act. Research ethics or ethics in research is about how we apply moral principles to the process of carrying out research. And it's important to remember that because discussions about research ethics often dial down just on the mechanics, the processes. OK, I want to do a research project. I've been told I need ethical approval. How do I get that ethical approval? What's the process? And the first thing to note about that focus is that it's understandable, it's unhelpful. Research ethics is about considering the ethical implications of your research in the round and that's throughout the entire life cycle of your research process from the moment you come up with a theory or an idea to the moment you disseminate it archive it and move on to something else it is not just about a particular stage in your research it's something that needs to be considered throughout we always need to be ethical in what we do and the second misconception Perception is that the processes for research ethics review is about gaining an ethical opinion on the proposed work. It's not about getting approval. That's something else. That's something called research governance. There are lots of other terms that can cross over with research ethics, and I've highlighted two of the key ones here. So research integrity is basically about good practice in research at the level of individual research projects, at the level of organisational environments, behaviours, cultures and systems, and the national and international level for the systems and processes by which research is conceived, funded, carried out, monitored, disseminated and assessed. And research governance is about how research is regulated and managed and are they overseen by the responsible organisation for the research, often called the sponsor. Now, all three of these things are relevant to your research project throughout its entire life cycle. Ethics and governance are linked to different aspects of research integrity. Ethics is primarily linked to good research practice, governance to responsible research sponsorship and it's research governance that gives you the approval. Research ethics is about giving a view on the ethics of your research, but the kind of approval, the stop go if you like, is part of research governance, not something that ethics committees itself decide on. Ethics committees exist to give that ethical opinion. Now, the frameworks for research ethics and consideration of research ethics dates back many decades. And it's important to remember why this stuff exists. It exists so research is done not only legally, but in a moral way. And it's important that, to remember that guidance for ethics has often been driven by breaches of duty of care, of breaches of ethics and mistreatment or worse of people in research. The first three bullet points list some key guidance or declarations on research ethics and the first one the Nuremberg Code is so named because it came out of the Nuremberg war trials of the Nazi regime following World War II and that regime undertook what they called as medical experiments on participants which were horrific they were war crimes. It's also worth noting that under the legal codes of the Nazi regime that research was legal but it certainly wasn't ethical. And that's worth a distinction worth making because law and ethics ideally cover the same area, but they often don't. So there's been evolution of research ethics code and guidance since then. And a key one in the UK is the Belmont Report, which talks about key principles such as respect for persons, beneficence, that is maximising benefits of participation while minimising potential harms and justice. So making sure that benefits but also risks are distributed fairly and not tainted by bias or other forms of misdistribution. And today in the UK, there's therefore a wide variety of research ethics, both in terms of requirements and also guidance. Your research organisation that you're part of, your university or NHS trust or whatever, will have research ethics guidance. The bodies that fund your research 
will have requirements for research ethics in the terms and conditions of those funding contracts so they're binding on you charities such as uk rio have produced guidance it's worth noting in the uk that the nhs is fairly standardized nationally a lot to do with the work of the health research authority or hra but in the higher education sector, there's lots of variants. UK Rio, with a body called Armour, put out some standard operating procedure for research ethics, and they are followed quite widely. But there's still a lot of variation. So as a researcher, it's really important that you familiarise yourself with the various requirements codes of practice etc that impact on your research some of those will be from your organization some from your funder and partner organizations but you know membership bodies that you're members of learning societies and like discipline specific organizations also produce relevant guidance and as you familiarize yourself with that guidance that then empowers you to answer key questions during the conception of your research and these are questions which research ethics committees will probably want to ask you as well but it's important i think to think about it yourself beforehand you know and some of this is quite fundamental you know what is it that you're doing but also why are you doing it and that speaks also to the need for a degree of originality in research who else is going to be involved a uh, lots of ethical questions and issues relate to the involvement of people in research but going back to what i said earlier even if you've got no people involved at all apart from you and your colleagues there can still be ethical issues in research and ethical issues are also about not just what takes place during the research but afterwards what will you do with it what might others do with the research how might it be used but also how might it be misused and it's important to note that your duty of care to participants, one should also consider the implications for participants after the research finishes, though most of the questions tend to understandably relate to what's going on during a research process. How will they be recruited to a research project? How will you seek and obtain, if they're willing, informed consent for them? But also other questions. For those of you in certain disciplines, the, the idea of thinking, will my participants know they're involved in a research project? might seem a bit odd but there are traditions of covert research for example in the social sciences where these issues need to be carefully considered we then move to sort of the process for ethical review and it's worth noting this is often a mandatory requirement this isn't an optional extra National guidance such as the Concordat to Sport Research Integrity, guidance from funders, UK Rio's guidance of which this is an extract, all stress that good practice includes compliance with all legal and ethical requirements, and that includes submitting research proposals for ethical review where appropriate and abiding by the outcome of that review. And you do that abiding throughout the entire life cycle of your research project. This isn't, uh, as I said, a discrete stage where you kind of think about ethics for a bit and then park the ethical section of your brain for the rest of your research project. So if you're part of an organisation, it's vital you seek guidance from it on the process of ethical review. If you're in an organisation, perhaps a small one that doesn't have a process or an independent researcher, it's more challenging. But there is guidance on the UK Rio website, for example, that you can refer to on the various ports of the call available to you. It's also worth noting the remit of NHS research committee, ethics committees. Now, they exist via the HRA and a system called IRAS, to, which is a national system to review research that involves NHS patients or carers. If a study is reviewed by the NHS ethically, most but not all research organisations don't then do a review of their own. They keep a record of the favourable ethical opinion. However, this can vary. So again, it's very important for you to check with your parent organisation how to do, how to act in that sort of situation. And it's also worth considering whether what you're actually doing is research or not. Universities tend to have a broader definition of research than, say, the NHS does, and the HRA and the NHS only looks at research projects. Projects that fall within the other categories are addressed in other ways. Now, looking at research ethics committees in the ground, in the round, what do they do? Well, what they don't do is they don't give approvals. Approvals is the role of the sponsor organisation, so your university, appropriate NHS body and the like, not the research ethics committees. 
In research governance, the sponsor role is incredibly important. It's the body that takes responsibility for the overall management and oversight of a research project taking place in its name. And part of that management and oversight will include ensuring that a favourable ethics opinion has been given before the project goes ahead. Now, a common misconception amongst researchers is the only thinking, the only thing that stands between them and pressing the go button is rec approval, where in reality, the opinion from an ethics committee is then considered by the sponsors one of the many things necessary for it to give approval to the research to go ahead. It's, so what they do is they'll review your studies protocols or methodology. They'll do so proportionately, and that can be because of the initial self-assessment process that sets out what the potential ethical issues might be, and therefore whether it's necessary to do a deep dive into the project or a lighter touch review. They'll give an opinion, said so an opinion, not an approval, and that can be favourable. This is good. Go ahead. It can be favourable with additional conditions. We're happy for you to go ahead, but you need to do the following extra things. It could be provisional. You know, this seems OK, but we want you to go and make some changes and then come back to us. Or it could be unfavourable. This project is unethical and therefore does not get a favourable opinion from this committee. And it's worth noting also that ethics is an ongoing thing. Ethics review isn't a one off thing. Researchers should always feel free to go back for advice and support. Now, to carry out these duties, there are some kind of key standards that research ethics committees meet. They need to be free of bias. And that comes from a diverse membership and keeping a key eye on conflicts of interest. They need to be competent. They need to understand ethical issues and have appropriate training. Both the committee itself and the processes, they really need to be about helping research be the best it can. This is about enabling, about facilitation, making sure that researchers and ethics committees and the broader systems can work together to encourage the production of ethical research. And they need to be transparent and accountability. So the processes, uh, learning points and the like are freely accessible by other members in the organisation. So they understand what they're going through. Also, what the ethics committees deal with and interesting uh, learning points that come out of that. The review will look at many things and here are kind of five key points, but not the only ones. And again, while reviews understandably focus on research participants, for those of you carrying out research that doesn't involve participants, ethical review is still essential. Design and conduct of the project will be examined. Now, there's a kind of slight dichotomy here because design and methodology are not really part of ethics review. This is about ethics, not good research practice. However, poor design and flawed methodology invariably results in unethical research. And it can also, at the very least, it will result in research that wastes the participants' time. So while they're not detailed methodological assessors, the Ethics Committee will be looking at design and conduct of the project. They'll be looking also with, at participant issues and issues of data and the like. Uh, for those of you working with not people, but their data. But the key points for human participant research, for example, will be how they're recruited, how informed consent is obtained, uh, looking at their care and protection, looking at confidentiality, confidentiality issues. My apologies, I've got a slight cold today. OK, now that's a kind of broad overview. We haven't done a deep dive into some of the nuances of ethical review, but uh, our next expert speaker is far more qualified to speak about that. And we'll now do a deep dive into the topic and then we'll have the Q&A session. So thank you very much. It's back to you. Thanks, James. I always find it really helpful just to go through in a stepwise way the sort of processes and what we think we know about ethics. I don't know how you learned about research, but for me, it was very much a sort of whistle stop tour of here are all the methods and here's how to do analysis. And uh, if you're going to do your own research, go and get ethics. And that was very much it. I, I don't remember 
having formal training on the process of ethics. And I definitely don't remember ever being told why we need ethics in research at all. Um, you might have had a better experience than me, and I hope so, but you might not have done. So I think it's important to flag that first and foremost, that we have issues around the way that research is taught. And a lot of the reasons for misconduct and poor ethical practices is around the fact that we don't know what we don't know. Um, and the tricky part of this problem, though, is that it's our job to know as well. So I think with James's information and other stuff we'll talk about today, I'm not expecting you to go away thinking, oh, great, I know all about it. Or worse still, oh, I now have ethical approval for my research because we don't have that power. Um, what it is about thinking around is what do I know? What don't I know? And where else might I go and find out some more information? Uh, the thing to note is that I think with where James was talking, you can see it's a very detailed, complicated area that isn't hard to follow if you're instructed, but there's a lot to take in. But we're often encouraged to do things very, very quickly. You know, you've got to get that data, you've got to publish that paper, you've got to get that conference address out there. And none of that gets us thinking and going slowly and planning, which is really what we need for ethical practice. So. I think the thing to remember in this is that how we're often taught is that there are methods and there's analysis and there's budgets and there's all sorts of things going on and they're all distinct from each other and they're also all distinct from us as researchers. That's not right. Actually, all of this is interconnected and part of the problem that we have is that by being taught about this in such a fractured manner, we often don't make those connections. Now, Contemporary approaches to sort of the way we understand ethics and think about research ethics, and I'm referring to research ethics here rather than a sort of more philosophical approach, is a big change actually in the last decade. Um, what we're really thinking about now is about how we as researchers remain responsible for ethics throughout the whole of our project. It begins and it ends and it lives through us. It's about our integrity. It's about our conduct. It's about the work that we do. It's not something that happens outside or in any kind of, of um, sort of disconnected manner. It's everything is all together. Now, although I've said that's a contemporary view, um, it's not new. Uh, I think any of you who are familiar with Indigenous research particularly it initiated and it became an idea it sprung from there. Um, a lot of feminist research, a lot of critical research, a lot of activist research were the ones talking about the fact that all of this stuff fits together. However, it's taken a long while for it to start becoming accepted, I think, in wider discourses around uh, research ethics. And even now, there's still some resistance. Um, now, there's quite a lot of scholars talking about this. I can't claim credit for any of it. So I will share uh, uh, some of the key papers that I really like to use at the end of this session. But a couple of people I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, one is Bacola Oyenloye, and, and she invites us to think about ethics as a sort of participant-centered, values-based approach. So it's not really about sort of ch checklists and following uh, formats and, and, and about um, regulations, although obviously regulatory aspects are integral to the work we do. It's much more about, you know, who do we begin with and what are their needs and what are our values and what are their values? And then we've also got uh, Vivek Dahal, who encourages us to really think about academic integrity, uh, which I know is very much part of what UK Rio is, is driven by, and research ethics in a very much an integrated approach. So again, none of this stuff is disconnected or, or sort of taken as apart from each other. It's about everything we do, but it's also about everything other researchers do and have done. So the wider consequences of that work, good or bad, will inform the way that other people react to ethics and how we then act within those ethical spaces. So that starts with what are our questions? How are we going to review the literature? What literature are we looking at? Who are we going to cite? Who do we leave out? Who do we bring in? Who, who, how do we understand this work? 
Um, when we're going to use a method, which one do we pick and why and how and what are driving those choices? And then when we carry out our research, when we plan it, when we fund it, who pays for it, who's going to be involved in it? How do we reach them? How do we support them? Uh, how do we do our analysis? How do we collect our data? What systems do we use for collecting that data and recording that data and archiving and storing that data through to the way that we then write up our work, how we choose to pick on particular angles, how we disseminate our findings, um, and how do we conduct ourselves through the whole process. All of that is ethics. Um, if you've been taught to think of ethics as a, I'm going to apply for an ethics committee, that might feel quite strange because, again, it separates out these different activities into kind of discrete units, which, of course, they aren't, because every single one of those things will inform the next. And really, other people find it different ways to approach this, but I like to go backwards. So like, where do I want to end up with my research and work back from there to make me start thinking around the sort of ethical aspects, the practical aspects, the funding aspects right from the start. The other reason I like this approach um, is it it lets us draw on those legacies that James was speaking of. Um, you know, where where do these ethics protocols and guidelines and, and um, codes come from? Why do we need them? How do they differ from each other? Because they're not all the same, actually. And some ethics codes were created in response to other ethics practices or lack of um, within academia. So I think there's an interesting thing of that legacy um, and how some legacies of research are amazing and transformative and progressive and do good. But actually, some research does distinct harm uh, to communities, to researchers, uh, to people who weren't the recipients of the research, but somehow were affected by it. So I think it's OK that people view it with suspicion. But if you've never been taught that, when you encounter that in practice, it can feel anything from frustrating to quite unnerving. It's like, why don't people want to join in my study and why are they asking me these difficult questions? And what is my job here? So I think it helps us to pause and I'm going to move slightly away from the areas that James was talking about to think about when we talk about unethical aspects that are around research. It's the kind of research culture that I'm very interested in and I think will be familiar to you when I, when I talk about it. So the things that are going to cause or worsen unethical practices aren't really evil researchers sitting there planning to do horrible things. It's not to say that people don't do awful things and haven't done awful things, but much more often the things you're going to encounter are unsafe working environments. So that's places where there's bullying or there's poor supervision or there's a lack of equipment or there's no funding or there's coercion or there's overwork, there's toxic competition, you aren't taught what to do, no one's checking in with you, but you're being pushed constantly to do things and you can't ask questions, you can't report concerns, um, there's no pathways or dialogues or conversations and it's very top down. If you're in that sort of environment, it's really easy to see how problems are going to happen how misconduct will occur, how mistakes will happen. You might not mean to do something unethical, but it's much more likely it's going to happen if you are not taught properly or supported properly or cared for. There's also the issue that I think when researchers are excluded, uh, either on purpose or just by accident, um, so it might be that people are left out because of where they live or the languages they speak or the faith that they have or their gender or their race, their sexuality, disability. Uh, we've already sort of touched upon today with the accessibility issue of captioning. You know, there's lots of situations when people are not able to join in as they should because things go wrong. And obviously, you know, in situations where we're doing things ethically, we try and fix them. I think it's really important to say that things can, what we can't do is promise risk free and totally safe environments in anything because things can happen that are totally beyond our control. But our plan really ethically is to make sure as few of those things happen as possible, that we make sure we avoid adverse events and we are not the cause of them. And if anything does go awry, we respond to it as swiftly and as um, supportively and, and as, as carefully as we can. 
Um, the other thing to note within that is there's often issues around work being appropriated. So it's really, really common that people do work and it's taken. The ideas are taken or the credit is taken or the, the sort of suggestions. So, for example, when I'm talking here about this integrated approach and saying to you, this isn't a new thing, that's really important because in a lot of cases where this is talked about at the moment, it's it, it's suggested to be an entirely new thing. And there's a whole ethical issue there around not saying who came up with these ideas in the first place, which is why referencing is important. Everything you do taps back to ethics. Ethics can be a really useful lens to see things through as well as an important and integral part of what you're doing. So when we take from communities and we misrepresent them or we coerce people into research or we ignore their expertise or their priorities, it, it's really common that communities tell us what they'd like us to do and we say, oh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this thing instead. Um, those things come under ethical conduct and sometimes they may not be reported but they're going to create an atmosphere they're going to cause mistrust they're going to make it that much harder for other people to do the work and when you've got other extractive practices you know to the point of say for example body parts um, being retained or misused in research or even really inappropriate treatment of human remains all of that paints a picture of us being untrustworthy and unsympathetic and unkind and that in turn has an impact on research integrity and the work we want to do or other communities would like to do. I think it's also really really important to stress that you might have been taught ethics in the way I've seen done a lot which is that people will come on with often quite traumatizing examples of really awful experiments or ones that are awful, but everyone laughs at them. They're kind of treated as a joke. Or, and then the kind of message is, oh, that was a horrible thing we used to do, but we, we wouldn't do that now. Or that was a horrible thing only a small number of people did, but we wouldn't do that now. Whereas actually people are doing unethical things all the time, sometimes deliberately, mostly not on purpose quite often because of the structures and the constraints in which they're working. But again, when you think about it, if we're not making our work accessible and inclusive and we're not thinking about our histories or where all this stuff comes from. It's not just a literature review that looks at your research, it's about the literature review that looks at the ethics of that research and the practice of that research and the communities and where you're going and who you're reaching and what you're going to do that all comes back to planning really, really carefully. So we have a duty of care and a responsibility to ourselves to our participants, to communities and to the environment. And I think that's another thing that we forget in this, that this is all taken as if it happens in an abstract space without any footprint, without any other thing happening. And the environmental aspect of our research is huge, is absolutely huge and always needs including. So as you can see, it's not just a sort of tick box of I'm going to get ethical approval. I've given you a whole load of things to think about, which I hope makes it sort of seem so much more meaningful to you. For me, this is the bit that made ethics suddenly come alive. And I saw that there was a point, but I also saw there was a role for me in it. It wasn't just me, you know, going through checklist activities. It was me and my integrity and my learning and my wisdom and what I had to offer, but also really crucially being humble and what I had to learn and knowing when I shouldn't be there and when I've got something to offer. Um, so I think that's the bit that I really wanted to cover. I'm gonna briefly say a bit about safety just because I'm fascinated by it and it li links to this and I know some of you asked about it. Some research does require extra caution, scrutiny and care. It might be because of the needs of the researcher. It might be because of the topic of the research. It might be because of the needs of the participants or wider communities or wider audiences or all of those things together. And this is going to begin with your planning and your budgeting and your timeframes and your training and ensuring that you've got the right equipment and do risk assessments and things like that. Quite often what we do at the moment is that work only happens on research deemed dangerous or traumatic. And the word trauma is thrown around a lot at the moment. I'm not sure it's always fully understood. It doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be thinking about research trauma. But I think we should do it very critically and carefully because it's a bit of a buzzword that will drop it into a bid and say, yes, we thought about safety or trauma or ethics. But have we? Have we really? We definitely need to get better at that. And we can't assume that particular communities or people uh, or places are dangerous and others are safe. Uh, problems can happen 
all over the place in research. The worst experience I had in my research, most of my research is on sensitive topics. The worst experience I had was nothing to do with my research. It happened to occur outside a place I was doing research, but it was nothing to do with it. So there'll be things that we see and hear and observe that are directly linked to our research that we need to be careful over. And there'll be things that are just happening in the wider environment. And there can be all sorts of things that, that you wouldn't necessarily consider as a safety issue or a well-being issue because you've decided the research is safe that actually might not be so. So when we're thinking about these big global responsibilities and then these smaller localised responsibilities and how ethics relates to everything we're doing on our funding and everything else, we've also got to think about our own selves and the people we're working with so that we don't become the risk, that we don't become the danger, but equally we're not in environments that actually make us unsafe or make us too scared to flag problems that might be occurring. Because again, as we've heard, that's where unethical problems uh, or unethical practices will arise. So I'm going to stop there and then James and I are going to go through some of the questions you asked and hopefully if you've got other questions we'll try and tackle those as well. Um, James I think you've got the first two questions if you don't mind reading the question and giving your answer please. Sure okay so thanks Petra. The first question was why do researchers fear research ethics committees and I think I touched upon this earlier they fear them because Partly it's human nature. Your research is going to be scrutinised by a panel of people and you don't know what the outcome will be. Partly I think that fear is also driven by some misconceptions about the process and that the key one is what I said earlier, that the Ethics Committee is the, gives approvals. It doesn't. It gives an ethical opinion. It is your host organisation, the one that is the university that's teaching you or the university or hospital or charity or private sector body or government department that employs you that gives approval for your research to go ahead or not. Obviously, ethical, a favourable ethical opinion is an important part of that, but equally projects can be said no to because of questions about GDPR or health and safety or trusted research and the like. There are lots of other, there are lots of reasons why research could not get the go ahead. And I think ethics committees unfairly have this reputation of being the gatekeepers. They're not. I think also a lack of understanding about the process contributes to and enhances that fear, as I've said. So my hope is that talks like this and various forms of guidance that Petra and I have promoted will help ease that fear. It's understandable to be scared, I think, because it is, you know, it's, it's difficult putting your research out for scrutiny. But it's worth bearing in mind that the people around the ethics committee, with the exception of a few lay members, will all be researchers themselves. So they'll, they'll all have been in your shoes. And also, while your research is unique to you, it will have commonalities with the research that has gone before. So it's very unlikely that your ethics committee will see your research project and it will be completely alien to them. They will have seen studies like it before. So they're not going in with a lack of knowledge. Ethics committees are also there to facilitate and enhance research. They're there to help you do the best research that you can. So the fears are understandable, but it's okay not to to be scared okay so try and move away from that fear they're not gatekeepers and they are there to help you and ethics committees are made up of researchers like you they're part of the community so they're not olympian figures giving a thumbs up or thumbs down to a research project the next question was how do i seek consent for a patient that doesn't have capacity and it's worth noting that capacity issues can manifest themselves in many ways. It could be someone who is not legally or mentally competent to give consent. Equally, it could be that the nature of the research means that seeking consent is challenging. So covert research, for example. Uh, so the first thing is to seek advice from your institution and also look for disciplinary specific advice. So, for example, the Social Research Association has a lot of advice on covert research, for example. It's also thinking about <coughs> if my participant uh, doesn't legally have capacity, is there someone who speaks on their behalf, who advocates on their behalf and has the legal ability to 
give consent to participate in this, for example, parents with children, for example, uh, schools have permission that they liaise with parents to give consent for participation in certain research projects with their students, for example. It's also worth noting that involvement of the person whether they have consent or not in the recruitment process and the consent process of seeking consent is very important if you look at clinical care the gillick principles for example make it clear that when even when children are under the age where they can give legal consent they should be involved in discussions about consent for treatment and so it's very important to not exclude people from conversations and discussions simply because they are not legally able to consent themselves. Petra, would you like to come in with any follow-up? Um, yeah, only just to add to that, I think that um, if you've got people who are in situations where they are less able to consent or somebody else might be consenting on their behalf, um, as James has said, you still need to explain the whole thing through them. There still needs to be a dialogue. They still need to be involved and they still have the right to refuse. So say, um, I don't know, one of my kids uh, was approached uh, by researchers through their school to do research and the school was very happy for them to do research. And I was absolutely delighted for them to join in the research. And they said no then that's their choice. I can't make them and nor can the school. So I, sometimes researchers get a bit confused on that in that they think, well, if, if the overall consent has been given, it gives me a green light to coerce the other person or pressurise them. Um, I think it's also really important to remember, again, with legacies, that a lot of research, most of which had ethical approval, actually, was conducted around orphanages, uh, prisons and other settings, psychiatric hospitals were places where people were potentially in more vulnerable positions or couldn't necessarily consent or capacity issues might have been at play. Um, and I mean, there's some quite horrendous examples of them, actually, where, again, I think that we need to be aware of that history and that past so we don't perpetuate it. And also we can anticipate that some people will be bothered um, but also, I think not to be patronising or to assume that because, say, for example, somebody has a learning difficulty, uh, that they can't consent in research or can't be researchers themselves. You know, we've got excellent examples of researchers leading it who themselves are have a learning disability, for example. Yeah, and just quickly coming back, I think a point about hierarchies is very important and that also particularly is relevant if you're going through an organisation, if there's often called gatekeeper research and sometimes those organisations can have very defined hierarchies like a prison or a military organisation where people are obliged to effectively follow orders. However, there can still be hierarchical pressures. I recall a some friends of mine who were psychology students, which is a long time ago now, in their first week of term, they got their, they met their personal tutor who said, welcome to the university, welcome to the department, and by the way, you're now subject to my research study. And they didn't feel like they could say no. So even when people are competent, be mindful of the pressures they can be under. Consent should be informed, it should be enthusiastic, and it should be, a de the decision to consent should be one made free of pressure. I think our next question is what ethics panels are likely to ask. So, James, are you all right to start with sure. this and then I'll jump in? Absolutely. I mean, I covered this in some of the, the slides uh, and a lot of it uh, will be about, you know, how people are being treated, but also the overall aims of the research and how it might be used and misused. Other questions are, are participants being treated respectfully because participants aren't just you know living sources of data they are people are researchers being uh, are researchers showing empathy uh because you know participants have lies beyond their role of research participants you know are researchers being humane and compassionate and that's particularly important where research where participants lack capacity or are vulnerable or disadvantaged in a way or be disadvantaged by the research project and it's important to remember that researchers concerns can be quite different from those of participants. For example, participants have a right to withdraw. 
And it may be as a researcher, you think that's a really trivial reason for a person to withdraw. For that person coming forward saying want to withdraw from the research project, that won't be a trivial reason. It may seem that to you, but you only have you don't live in that person's shoes and you only have a snapshot into their life. So I think ethically, a lot of this is about how we are treating people. Thank you. I was just going to add to that um, that it ethics committees vary in terms of whether you can actually attend the sessions or not. Um, I think increasingly a lot of meetings happen online now and that can be quite useful because you can often turn up for the bit when your um, research is being heard. Sometimes you can go in person, sometimes you can't go at all. I've had all of those experiences and James might be able to come back up on this. Um, it, it's also interesting if you're doing research cross-nationally that you might have to do committee meetings with other countries and in my experience you might well be asked some very difficult and challenging questions rightly so about what you actually want to do and why you know why do you have this interest here in this country this community this topic um, but if you are able to go um, I would always recommend you do because a lot of the questions they have um, I, I think as, as, as James has illustrated earlier this is about them knowing you know what to do uh, you know, are you going to be able to manage this piece of research? Are you understanding what's going on? If you're there answering the questions, you can probably tell that this person knows what's going on. If they can't answer it, well, that's something to flag up separately. If you're not there, they're going to ask you lots of questions you've got to answer before the work can proceed. Sometimes they'll ask you very random things. I, I, I had a, an example where we were giving vouchers out, uh, five pound vouchers for people participating in research. Um, back where five pounds was actually worth something. And um, we, the ethics committee discussed for ages why we were giving it from one shop and not another. And I was like, I really don't know why this is important, but obviously I was polite and I answered the question. And, uh, uh, you know, if I hadn't have been there, they would have probably still asked that and I'd have had to write an explanation. So I think if you can go, it's a dialogue, it's a conversation. Remember as well, if you're not sure about something, you can ask the ethics committee, as well as asking your supervisors, your colleagues, your peers, your professional societies, all the other places and reading and getting training and everything else. You can ask the ethics committee if you don't know. Sometimes you'll ask them and they'll say, well, I don't know either, I'll go and find out. But it's really important that there is that dialogue there. Asking them a question is not the same as ethical approval. But it's don't, as, as we said earlier, don't be scared of them because we are all in this to make research better. Yeah. And if I can just quickly come in, while committees have a process and a timeline, they will have encountered situations before where things need to move quickly. Well, if there is a reason why you think, oh my goodness, there's this fantastic recruitment opportunity coming up, I need to go for it, but I won't have ethics approval, don't do that. Talk to the ethics committee and go back and say, look, this is happening. The approval process isn't due and the approval, the, the opinion process isn't due to do this. What can be done? Sometimes there can be a fast track review process or they may be able to say, yes, you can go ahead with that. Even if you're convinced it's OK to go ahead, don't do it because you could be breaking the law. You could be you'll be breaking the requirements of your institution, possibly your funder. You could be invalidating the, the insurance and your research project and also it may well be that though you think your research is ethical and fine to go ahead, it isn't. The committee may see stuff that you've missed. So if you think there's a pressing reason that you need to move more quickly than the ethical approval process allows for, go back to the committee and say, this has come up, what can we do? And sometimes the answer may be, I'm sorry, you can't do anything, in which case there'll be ways around it. You could, in that scenario, you might not be able to recruit people, but if there's an event where your study population, desired study population, that are present in large numbers, you could raise awareness of a forthcoming project, for example, and ask people to get in touch if they might be interested in learning more. So there's always something you can do. And ethics committees will have encountered those situations before so don't be afraid to go them with questions and don't go to be afraid to go to them if your requirements aren't going to mesh with their timelines 
I'm aware we're we're coming to the end. This has gone so it always goes so fast these sessions. Um, James, are you okay if we? I, I just wanted to jump ahead because there's a few questions that we were going to answer, but actually I think we've covered. Um, I wondered, James, if you would be okay answering the question in a minute about insider research, and then we also had a question about using AI to fill in epics forms, which I think we should answer, and I think probably some of you will have opinions as well. It, just to note as well, if you have got resources from your institution or other books or things you've read or used or maybe from other organizations that, that are helpful that you want to also put into the chat please do because I think sometimes at these sessions especially if you're from lots of different countries there'll be really brilliant resources that we weren't aware of that would be great for everyone to learn from so again this is a dialogue uh, you know feel free to add so we're going to cover about sort of insider research AI and then I was just going to talk a little bit about social media and then if we've got time we'll have a quick look back over some of the questions we've been asked and see if we get time to do them as well but we, we'll see if we don't as I said we'll make sure we give you the information on that in the sort of information that goes out after the webinar so James are you able to give us some ideas about the challenges of insider research please I mean, in, insider research is can be broadly defined as you're researching a community or a space or an organization which you are a part of and so i think there are concerns there now there are concerns about bias we know we are all biased with personal situations and it doesn't mean you shouldn't do this type of research but you should be honest about the fact that you have a bias and therefore you, you can't be fully objective there's also there can sometimes be the sense as well i know this community i know these people so and people won't say this to themselves overtly, but you may think, well, do, do I need to follow all the rules? I know these people. I know, you know, and my design, my proposals for consent, the reporting methods, they'll all be fine with that because this is a known quantity. And actually, you may not be, that opinion may not be as valid as you think. And the other thing is, again, thinking that you still need to consider the impact and the dignity of the well-being of the community that you're part of and the impact of it. And sometimes being part of a community can lead you to assume that people will be OK with things that they're not. Also, the fact that you are part of that community can expose you to new risks of harm or heighten existing risks of harm. If you're res researching a controversial research topic, for example, if it's going to be with a group of people after whom you will have minimal contact, Act, that insulates you somewhat to any fallback that they may decide they don't like the research project or express very strong views during the, the, the information gathering process. And equally, when you disseminate research, if it's about a community, if you're doing something controversial about a community that you are part of, then in many ways you have to kind of live with whatever happens within that community or to that community during and after the research project. So it's something to be careful of. It's also worth bearing in mind that even if you're part of a community, all the normal kind of legal and other government's permissions still apply. So say you have a dual role as a PhD student and you're a teacher and you want to do some education research in your school or you're a clinician doing a research project in your GP practice. You still need to have all the relevant organisational permissions, regulatory requirements and the like. And Again, your, fam your familiarity with those environments will have helped to you, but they can sometimes cause you to miss things. Thank you. Um, the next question is, should I use AI to fill in an ethics application form? And uh, I wondered if, if uh, you could, uh, you don't have to join in with this, but maybe everyone listening has a quick guess of what you think James and I are about to say um, but um, James do you want to go quickly first and I'll just I'll talk because I know you had a brilliant answer when we, we were talking about this before but and then I'll, I'll join in I mean from I, I think you know the answer would be no I think firstly any use of AI you need to check whether it's permitted in research and also you should declare it uh, secondly it's worth thinking about the data ownership here. Most AI platforms, if you're using the free ones, anything you put into them, they own. So if you say, here's my here's a skeletal thumbnail prompt of my research project write it if you put any confidential data into your thumbnail prompt you just breach confidentiality thirdly the ethics committee wants to hear from you not a person now you may need it's okay to get help 
writing your ethics application from your supervisor if you're not fluent in the language in which the application must be made get help translation but i'd say it's it's a no to ai yeah, i i think it's it's such a fascinating topic i think it's it's one that's really it's really interesting if you track a sort of academic trends of what people are interested in covid is no longer the thing and now it's ai and everyone's got an opinion and doing research on it uh, it's here to stay it's been here for a long time and i think we are are going to learn to live with it my my sort of thoughts on it really are that um or i suppose my concerns with it are that a lot of people use it because of the barriers that i was talking about earlier around sort of languages and access and if you can't get hold of training and if you've not been taught how to do this and you don't speak the language it makes perfect sense that for essays or applications or all sorts of things you would use ai however a lot of the stuff it's trained on is not necessarily good uh, some of it can be brilliant, some of it isn't, but it's very samey. And as we heard earlier, a lot of the stuff you're taught about research is in these discrete boxes that don't relate to each other, that re repeat the same boring, you know, limited ideas about stuff that are not accessible or inclusive or diverse or welcoming or thoughtful or critical or, you know, just doing a good job. So my worry is, is if you don't know much about ethics and you're new to the area and you're using something to fill in a form for you, and it could be AI, but it could also be another person. If one of you said to me now, Petra, will you fill in my ethics form? And you've not done ethics really before, you won't know whether I've done a good job. I, I might do a brilliant job. It might be terrible. You'll find out when you get to the ethics committee meeting. So I think it's about the fact that for now, it's using with caution, it's thinking about the ethics of AI, it's thinking about why you need it. Could you get that help elsewhere? There are other places you might be able to get that support. Flagging the inequalities that are driving this and also a lot of the prejudice that's pinned around this. There's a whole load of suspicion of who will use AI, you know, and, and all sorts of nasty, unpleasant, mainly racist actually stereotypes about that. I think all of that needs challenging too. Um, but uh, I would say maybe if you want to do your ethics form and then try it again and see what you get, you might find it helps you, you know, prompt that you've missed something. But to just use it without checking, it's just so risky. I, I think I would agree with James and say no. However, I will be interested in different opinions. Um, the other thing we were going to quickly talk about was social media, which I'll do. I think, unfortunately, we won't get time to do some of the questions you did ask yeah. in the chat, but I'll make sure we do cover those. So I'll, I'll finish off with social media. And so I was going to give you an example. Years ago, I did a study on older people in uh, they were in different sorts of care and I was comparing the care that they had. And that meant sometimes I interviewed them in hospitals and I would sit by their bed and talk to them and they'd have pictures of their family by them and maybe, you know, things you could see, different artifacts that would tell you a bit about them, like the hairbrush or a nightie at the end of the bed or something like that. There would be clues about them there. And I also visited them at home where I would get even more information about, you know, where they lived, their location, what the house was decorated like. Sometimes I'd go and there'd be tea prepared for me and um, that was always a good day um, obviously these are the days before social media so my question for you is if I was to do that research now would it be okay if I took a photo of the hairbrush on someone's nightstand or maybe the inside of someone's house or a selfie with me and a participant or maybe I film myself going to visit somebody, perhaps I'll comment on the neighbourhood that they live in, or, or I talk about, you know, how I feel about them. Um, bear in mind, in these studies, I saw people more than once. So we built up a relationship and some people I got on very, very well with and some people I, you know, barely built a relationship with at all. So in our social media age, if I was to document this work, it would be absolutely fine ethically if that was part of the research. So if we were co-designing and we were using say photo voice or different photography or I was videoing and it needed to be done for the research for the analysis the pers person knew they were being photographed they knew what it was for they knew why I was doing it and they completely agreed with that process it would be okay what is not okay and what I'm seeing more and more at the moment actually is either telling stories of things you've seen when you've been at research or photographing stuff around you and using that in presentations or putting it on your social media. 
um, it's not ethical if you haven't asked the person to do that as part of your research and they don't know. You could easily breach confidentiality, you know, not necessarily the participant, your own, but actually you don't know if you're in a neighbourhood who you're photographing and putting up. It's why in like schools, for example, we have such strong rules around safeguarding and things of what you can and can't photo and display that I know, again, social media is changing and challenging. Also, other people's stories are not necessarily yours to tell unless they've said you can tell them. So you all have lots of feelings. That's why diaries and um, debriefing and all these things and therapy even can be helpful. But this idea that you have the right to intrude on someone's life and, you know, think about maybe if it was you in hospital and someone took a picture of your clothes or uh, an awful example I heard about recently, which I'll put the link in into the discussion, was a presentation that somebody gave where they took a photo of the interpreter's home. They'd had a long relationship with this interpreter in the research. They'd been very kindly invited back to the person's home. And clearly it was meaningful to the researcher. But the thing they chose to focus on was the interpreter's outdoor toilet which they mocked in a presentation. Now, these kind of things we're seeing more and more of because we are, I think because social media is so ubiquitous, we think that these stories and discussions and things are fine. Unless it's part of the intrinsic study design, you have consent for and approval for, you cannot go around documenting everything else and sharing it for your own personal benefit. More than that, when we were thinking about insider research, it's actually quite a tricky thing to navigate now that you might want to talk about your research. And if people are rude about it, your whole community turns up and has your back. I've had that happen a couple of times and it's both brilliant and also slightly unnerving when it happens. But that's an ethical issue we need to be thinking around managing. So there's that whole safety aspect, that dissemination aspect and also your wider conduct. Universities are a bit slow on this. They do have social media policies, lots of which are not fit for purpose doesn't cover research interestingly but it's also your wider conduct the impression you're giving you can't just rock up to a Facebook group and demand people join in your research it makes people feel really unsafe you can't just intrude in social spaces so I think that probably is a topic for another day and I know I think that you've had a very good presentation on it yourself recently with UK Rio as well about sort of social media ethics that you might want to include James but certainly I'd like I you just to put that in the chat yeah perfect thank you so um, I think that's actually bringing us very neatly, if not slightly yeah. disjointedly, to the end of our, our session. So all I really want to do is just give James a, a couple of seconds to just give your takeaway key message from today and then I'll give mine. I mean, my key message is it's I'm sorry I didn't get to answer more of your questions. They're really vital ones. It shows great engagement with people wanting to understand more about research ethics and the process of ethical review. I think my key takeaway is this can seem like a scary process, but it's there to help and facilitate. So please do engage with your ethics committees and always make sure you understand the kind of the landscape of the system of, of opinions and ethical considerations you need to apply to your research, whether you need formal ethical review or not, because all research needs to be ethical. Just sort of to add with that, it, it starts and ends with you. And there's lots of other people out there who can help you and should help you. Um, we've got real responsibility here um, and research hasn't always been helpful or benign, but it also can be amazing and wonderful. And I think there's a real issue that we focus so much on the negatives and the sort of warning you not to be terrible people that we forget actually that none of us really want to be awful researchers. We want to do a good job and there are barriers that get in the way. So as much as we can, it's working together as a community and helping one another so that we actually can enjoy this process, that we can stay safe and we can do good research that makes a difference. That, that would be my takeaway. So just to remind you, um, the recording of this webinar will be available. It'll be cut slightly, I think, into sort of sections. There will be transcripts. There will be additional information and we'll try and match that information to our answers so it's easy for you to follow. Um, it will be shared to a follow up email that you'll get. It won't be right away. So bear with us if it doesn't appear straight away. Um, and it will also then appear on the careers advice section at the jobs.ac.uk website, which I recommend you have a look at because it's got loads of good stuff there. 
Um, if you want to recap on any of the topics, you know, just go back to jobs.ac.uk and, and follow them on social media, ask them, or message me and James. Um, I mean, again, UK we have got loads and loads of resources. I use it all the time and it's been invaluable to me in my career. So it's well worth diving in there. And if we don't know, we will know somebody who does know, so we'll help you. Um, and I'll just say on behalf of jobs.ac.uk, thank you very much, James, for giving up your course time today. And thanks for letting me go on about one of my favourite topics. And we hope you found it helpful and uh, see you again soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.